Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals? Senator for Smith. Senator Fifield. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the Senate at its rising adjourn till Monday, 13 May 2019 at 10 a.m. or such other time as may be fixed by the President or, in the event of the President being unavailable, by the Deputy President, and that the time of meeting so determined shall be notified to each Senator. The question is the motion moved by Senator Fifield be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The eyes have it. I promise not to act unilaterally. Senator Fifield. Rhetorical to Senator call Fifield. that one. Um, Mr. President, I move that uh, leave of absence be granted to every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting today to the day on which the Senate next meets. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I propose that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the federal seat of Petrie is home to many hard-working Queenslanders who want a hand up in life, not, not a hand out. And Petrie is represented in this parliament by one of the hardest working Australians I've ever had the good fortune of knowing, my friend and colleague Luke Howth MP. During the six years that Luke Howth has been the federal member, he's been fighting for locals and delivering for locals. The Bruce Highway has been upgraded. The Gateway Motorway upgraded. The Moreton Bay, Bay Link has been built. Uh, the Rothwell Roundabout fixed. Boundary Road has been upgraded. The Dolphin Stadium has been built. Luke has fought for funding to install CCCTV, keeping the community safer. Environmental projects, solar for local community groups and, of course, more funding for schools and hospitals. Luke Howth is a hard-working, honest man who is delivering for his community. He's exactly the sort of person we need in Parliament because he's exactly that type of person who fights for the people of Petrie. Bill Shorten's candidate for Petrie, Corinne Mulholland, doesn't even come close. She has no real-world experience, having worked for politicians and now the council for her entire career. She was campaigning for a year while still employed by the council, campaigning for the Labor Party on a cushy six-figure taxpayer-funded council salary. Worse, worse, Mr President, as detailed by the Sydney Morning Herald on 13 September of last year and by the Brisbane Times on 7 November 2018, the Labor candidate is connected to allegations of cronyism and corruption within the council. And as the Herald notes, Ms Mulholland controlled much of the Mayor's diary and oversaw the Council's events and marketing operations. This is the same Council that is now under investigation by Queensland's Crime and Corruption Commission. And I call on Ms Mulholland to come forward and, and detail— Order, Senator McGrath. Mm. Senator O'Neill. I, I, I think it's a shame at this time of the evening that we are subjected to this tirade from Senator McGrath, who is making all sorts of allegations. In, a, in an outrageous way. I think he should withdraw the allegations he's put to I, 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 Firstly, Senator O'Neill, I don't gather, unless you can correct me uh, on anything unparliamentary that has been said, um, and I will say that it is not uncommon for adjournment speeches to deal with similar subject matter. Senator McGrath, Senator O'Neill, I, I didn't hear anything unparliamentary. I'm happy to be corrected if there is something. I agree that it really wasn't worth listening to, but I do believe that the senator accused somebody of being corrupt. Now that's point of order, Mr. President. I've well, said there are allegations. Sure, that'd be great. I've said there are allegations. Yeah, that's that's low. Um, uh, well, Senator O'Neill, that's not unparliamentary. Um, senator McGrath. 
What we're seeing uh, for those listening at home is a protection racket, protection racket from the Labor, the Labor senators opposite who want, who want to cover up. And I call on Ms Mulholland to come forward and detail, detail her involvement in this dodginess, this dodginess that, 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 that the allegations are circulating about her. Come Senator forward Ketter, and detail on a point of order, Senator Ketter. Point of order. I just note the clock, uh, Mr. President, has been reset. Uh, so. Um, I, I, I think Senator McGrath had about three minutes to go. Senator McGrath. Uh, Senator McGrath. I'm disappointed, uh, Senator Ketter. I mean, I, I could speak for 20 minutes on on on, on the miscreant behaviour of, of Labor candidates, but um, and this is this is an addition to the hypocrisy of Bill Shorten's Labor candidate for Petrie on saving the North Lakes Golf Club from being sold to developers, an issue which the North Lakes community and Luke Health has been passionately advocating against. And Luke Health has been on the community side with this issue from the start. And it was only when Ms Mulholland saw that the community groundswell was starting to grow that she got on side. And this is really suspicious, Mr President, because Ms Mulholland was previously suspiciously silent on this important community issue. And many have said this is because it may have been due to her close relationship with the council. So the choice for locals in Petrie is between two polar opposites. There's Luke Howarth who has been working hard and delivering for his constituents. Luke Howell is a tradie who grew up at Bracken Ridge, who taught at the local judo club and has run his own business. And it's Luke Howell who understands the hard work that goes into providing for and raising a family, who will always be there for the people of Petrie and making sure it's easier for them to get ahead. Or there's Bill Shorten's Labor candidate. The Labor candidate has been taking advantage of, of, of ratepayer money and working for the Labor Party on the clock. The Labor candidate has never worked order. outside Senator of Senator the... McGrath. Senator, um, Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Well, Senator McGrath is getting a little excited, and I'm pretty sure he just accused. He didn't. He didn't say the word allegation. He just accused the uh, Labor candidate of taking something, taking money. Um, oh. Uh huh. Um. Senator O'Neill, again, if, if something unparliamentary was said, I'm happy to have the record brought to me. I didn't detect anything unparliamentary at that point. So, Senator McGrath, to continue. Protection racket, Mr. President. What we're seeing opposite here is a protection racket. Labor senators are coming in to try and protect this this poorly, poorly uh, performing Labor candidate up in Petrie, because they know that Luke Howarth is a brilliant local member, and Luke Howarth is going to hold Petrie like he did at the last election. And the arrogance of Labor, Mr. President. They thought they were going to take Petrie in 2016, and they didn't. And there was a swing. There was a swing to to Luke Howarth, and I guarantee you, Mr. President, there'll be a swing to Luke Howarth at this coming election. Now, so, so the choice is the choice is here. You can vote for, a, for a, a Labor candidate with all these allegations hanging over her, or you can vote for one of the hardest working members in Parliament, Luke Howth MP, and you can send a message to the protection racket over there. Send a message to the Labor Party and say you're going to stand up for stand up for real serving members of the community, not these fake plastic Labor people who come in here and you know, get their jobs in the public service. Stand up for people like Luke Howth because they're going to stand up for you. Thank you, Mr. President. Order, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, uh, that was a very entertaining uh, uh, dissertation from Senator McGrath. But I speak on a very important matter, uh, Mr. President. As Deputy Chair of the Joint Standing Committee of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I've learned a lot in the last uh, four or five years. I've learned an enormous amount about this sector, this community, uh, the people in it, the people who provide services in it, and we are engaged in what truly was a bipartisan uh, effort to dramatically change the lives of people with disability. And we've seen people's lives turned around through uh, acceptance into the scheme and funding of, uh, of their needs and aspirations. And we've seen ageing parents relieved of an enormous amount of uh, stress and worry because there is uh, something in place for their children uh, as they move into uh, you know, uh, more fragile circumstances. And, and there's no doubt that the, the agency has had an enormous task in front of it and has improved on its delivery. We need to thank the workers at the NDIA that worked so hard to make the lives of participants so much better. We've had wonderful uh, assistance from the Secretariat, uh, a wonderful team that's resourced the uh, Joint Standing Committee for uh, you know, a couple of parliaments now. Really great work. And as a senator for South Australia, the members and the senators' contact officers at the NDIA have helped enormously with representations.
from concerned NDIS participants and members of the public. You know, still the frustration with the scheme is there. Our families, carers, service providers and, and those people in the NDIS workforce are, uh, are under stress. There is a lot of concern about service delivery. There are providers who are concerned in a whole range of areas, and some would be even construed as additional red tape, which has been the, uh, quite contrary to the mantra of this government. But what we've come to, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, and I listened very carefully to Ms. Uh, Minister Fifield's answer to questions today uh, about the, uh, the use of surplus funds in the NDIS uh, appropriations in in balancing, so to speak, the budget. Now, nobody in the sector makes any, uh, any aspersions. It's entirely reasonable for governments to be prudent with taxpayers' money. But if you look at what the uh, Deputy Chief Executive has said, governments, of course, year on year will look at expenditure, and I can never guarantee you in any year that what a government would do. It, the scheme funds, used to be our appropriation. But the scheme funds are now the Department of Service, uh, Social Services appropriation. This technicality essentially makes the department the post box for NDIA money, currently worth about $18 billion, and makes it much easier for a government to obscure how much money is actually being spent. And it is this money which contributes to the predicted surplus. Very clearly. This is an accounting uh, shift, if you like, and there are people within the scheme who are not very happy about it, and I can understand why. There are people who require 24-hour, seven-day-a-week support, and in, through my office as late as last week, one such person was advised there are no funds available. 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week service, no funds available. Now there is a crisis allocation, there is a crisis process there, and you know it's unlikely that the person will be in that as dire a situation. But that's what they were advised. There are people who have an audiologist and a doctor verifying that their hearing aid is uh, not suiting their hearing requirements, and under the scheme uh, the decision is you have to wait till it depreciates a bit further before it gets replaced. <coughs> It doesn't make a lot of sense to people who cannot see their plan until it's been approved. And when it doesn't contain the things that they need, to be told you'll have to go through a review process, or the funds which were done under a state or territory allocation are not available under the NDIS scheme. It makes no sense to these people. It actually looks cruel and hurtful. And you know the government will do what governments do to balance their books, but the money in this scheme, properly and prudently appropriated for people with disability, should remain in that sector and be expended prudently, carefully, and in accordance with the scheme guidelines, not shifted. Order, Senator Gallagher. Senator Storer. Thank you, Mr. President. In an era of fake news, the ABC stands out like a beacon in Australia's media landscape. A public opinion survey by the Roy, Roy Morgan organisation is but the latest to confirm that the ABC is by far the nation's most trusted media organisation. For example, the survey found that while, while close to half of all Australians—47 per cent, to be precise—distrust social media, just 9 per cent distrust the ABC. 80 per cent of those polled trust the ABC, telling the Morgan organisation that their trust is driven by its lack of bias and impartiality, quality journalism and ethics. Yeah. Australians expect their ABC not only to be independent, but for the nation's broadcasters, management and board to protect that independence. The events of last August and September, the sacking of Michelle Guthrie and the subsequent resignation of Justine Milne, are at the very least undermine the confidence at the very least, undermine the confidence of Australians that the board and the managing director were, were defending the ABC's independence. Indeed, Mr Milne has acknowledged that he saw himself as a conduit between the government and the ABC. By his own evidence to the Senate inquiry of, that I participated into allegations of political interference to the ABC, 
By his own evidence to this and other interviews, he acknowledged his concerns about the impact of the reporting of some of the corporation's most senior journalists and Triple J's decision to shift its Hottest 100 broadcast would have an impact on ABC funding. In 2012, Parliament passed amendments to the ABC Act designed to ensure enhance independence, integrity and transparency in the process for appointing directors to the ABC board. This government has had a habit of ignoring the spirit of that legislation. Three appointees to the board by this government were not recommended by the independent nomination panel. A fourth was highly rated by the panel but then withdrew from the process but was subsequently appointed by the minister. As evidence to the inquiry indicated, the appointment, approach to appointments by this government may have directly led to the problems centering on Mr Milne and Guthrie. Only one member of the board had direct media experience. None, apart from the staff elected director, had experience in public broadcasting. Despite all that and the impression of many Australians that the government did put pressure on the ABC on many occasions, the Prime Minister again ignored the spirit of the appointment process with a captain's pick for the position of ABC board chair. Ida Buttrose does appear to be better qualified than any other recent appointment. But in the circumstances, I believe it would have been better that she had gone through the independent nomination process. The fact that she was not approached does not necessarily point to deficiencies in the appointment process. It may well have been a consequence of deficiencies in the approach taken by the executive search firm. This is one reason I readily, enjoyed, readily endorse the inquiry's recommendation to enhance the transparency and accountability of the nomination panel. Equally, I also endorse the recommendation to require the Prime Minister to table a statement advising the Parliament on the extent and outcome of consultations with the Leader of the Opposition on board appointments. No process will be perfect, but the more transparency the better, especially in the light of the events surrounding Mr Milne and Mr Guthrie. I would like to take note of the recommendation acknowledging in this report acknowledging the, that the benefit and desirability of stable funding as a guard in part against political interference. The ABC would like a five-year cycle rather than three, and they may well be right. However, I believe it is even more important to guard against out-of-cycle cuts to the ABC budget. Since this government came to office in 2013, the ABC has had its base funding cut by at least $340 million, according to the MEAA. No organisation can plan for its future on that basis. In my view, it would be wise for the national broadcasters, SBS as well as the ABC, to make public their funding requirements ahead of the budget cycle. The government should be required to then respond. That would be no guarantee of certainty, but at least if there were out-of-cycle cuts, the responsibility and consequences could be well and truly sheeted home. The ABC is the nation's most trusted and valued cultural institution. I sincerely hope that we will never see its independence challenged again by a government in the way we have seen in recent years, and that the inquiry we undertook, uh, and of which we delivered a major majority uh, uh, committee report, will in help ensure that this is the case. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Uh, Mr President, I'd just like to take the opportunity to note that that was perhaps the last contribution that we might have in this place from Senator Storer. And, um, I know it's just a, a little bit over a year since you've, you've been in this place, Senator Storer, and perhaps uh, you haven't grabbed as many headlines as other people who sit down at the end of that chap at, that cha at the chamber here with us. But I, I, um, while I wish that you had voted with the Labor Party on, on every occasion, I think it's really important to note that um, your contribution to this place has reflected an incredible uh, work ethic and a genuine, genuine and professional uh, manner of communicating with all of your colleagues. And I think your thoughtful con contributions to debate have really added to the work that we have done here in the Senate. And I think uh, your final speech here, still doing the work, uh, standing up for what you believe in and putting on the record your thoughts as part of the national debate for the historical record of the nation um, is worthy of comment and I think that you have been an embellishment to the chamber in the time that you've been here and I wanted that to be recorded and noted. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I remind senators that legislation committees are scheduled to meet to consider estimates commencing tomorrow morning at 9am. Program details will be published on the Senate website. The Senate stands adjourned and is scheduled to meet again on Monday the 13th of May at 10am.